Welcome to Longmont Voices and Vision, a project of Longmont Public Media. In the midst of the darkest period in our lives, when we're bombarded 24 hours a day with news of the coronavirus and the human and economic carnage it's causing in our society, we're challenged to cope with our fears and anxieties while remaining hopeful about what lies on the other side of this crisis. This project presents an opportunity for Longmont residents to share with others how they're adjusting to new realities of social distancing and the kind of future they hope to experience on the other side of the crisis. I'm Tim Waters, host of these conversations and a Longmont Public Media volunteer. In this series, I'll be asking Longmont residents, many of them your friends and neighbors, three questions. What are you doing to get through this crisis? Even though we cannot be together right now, how are we staying connected to friends and families? And what's the future you are hoping to see and experience on the other side of this crisis? I hope you'll stay with this series and enjoy listening to your friends and neighbors and learn from them how they're getting through and what they're looking forward to in a new reality on the other side. Mayor Brian Bagley, thank you for your willingness to lend your voice and your vision to this Longmont Voices and Vision project. So in addition to your contribution today, I just want to say thanks for your many years of service to this community as an elected official, uh, most recently and currently as the mayor. So thank you. Knowing the listeners, knowing that you're the mayor, tell us a little bit more about Brian Bagley so folks know who they're hearing from. Uh, well, uh, my name is Brian Bagley. I'm the mayor. Um, I've served on city council since November of 2017. I've been, I've served as mayor. I'm sorry. I've served, I've served as mayor since November of 2017. I've served on city council since November of 2011. Um, I currently serve in my second term and I did not think that I would be the mayor, uh, during the middle of the end of the world, as I jokingly refer to it, um, the pandemic. And so I've lived in Longmont since 1999. I've got four beautiful children and a beautiful ex-wife and, uh, and, uh, we've made Longmont our home and, um, and it's just been a real, a real joy to, to serve. Well, you know, I'm going to ask you three questions. Uh, the first of those three questions really is uh, based on the fact that we are all experiencing, as you've said, you, you didn't imagine you were going to be mayor during the end of the world. None of us thought we would be experiencing what we are now with uh, the effects of this pandemic on all aspects of our society. So uh, in a time that none of us have any experience with, right, we're all trying to get through. How are you getting yourself through this incredible moment in history? Well, for, first of all, it's hard. I mean, fl flat out, flat out, it's difficult on a personal level. Um, how I get through is uh, I've got some a few close friends that I that I reach out to. Um, I've got a I've got a German Shepherd pup. I've got my kids, and uh, I've got uh, employees. I've got a city. And so I've got a lot of responsibility and duties that, that do not allow me to get too depressed and too down. But um, the isolation is difficult, you know, not being able to go out and socialize and, and do the things that keep us healthy, both physically and mentally. Right now, the gyms are closed, so uh, I can't work out at the gym. Um, I still go for a run every day, but that's not quite the same. Uh, uh, I have a law practice with employees and we can't open our doors. So I'm dying to get back to work. I'm dying to get back into my routine. And not only have we, are we facing an unprecedented crisis as far as just social isolation, uh, medical uh, danger with the virus, so to speak, um, but the, and all, all the implications that come along uh, as a result of being in your home all the time. And uh, the coping mechanisms aren't there. And so um, it's a very unique time in history, indeed. Yeah, it is. And, and um, part of what is unique, uh, at least in our lifetimes, maybe in the Spanish flu, they had some similar experience with physical distancing and social isolation. But, but, but nobody alive today has experienced what we're going through. So all of, with all that separation, the fact we can't be together physically, how are you staying connected with your friends and family? Well, I mean, when, when you look back on it, there's going to be, uh, uh, 
I, I, so I, I'm complying uh, with the stay at home order, but uh, I am personally faced with two, two, de two decisions. One, go out in the world and face the virus or two, stay here and uh, get depressed and suffer mental illness and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm staying connected through text messaging, through phone calls, through Zoom, through WebEx. Those yeah. are two programs. I don't know if they're going to exist in the future, but I didn't know about Zoom or WebEx before this. Um, I go, uh, I visit my children at their mom's house. Um, I go visit close friends, um, people that I say are within my social bubble. So we're not uh, out there, uh, we're not out there uh, interacting with, with a whole host of people, but they're the same people that we're all kind of supporting one another to make sure that we're okay. And so um, that, that's what I'm doing. Well, uh, staying connected obviously is a, more of a challenge and also probably more important than ever. Um, and, and as we do this, we anticipate uh, an end to this pandemic or at least to the, we can, we can only hope. This, yeah, yes. to the effects of the pandemic. And it's the, the, the last question, the presumption that underlies the question is that whatever, whatever was normal uh, before we got into this, into the stay at home kind of lockdown scenario and the social distancing, whatever the world looks like on the other side of this, likely to work, look somewhat different than it did going in. Indeed. So uh, the last question is, assuming the world's going to be different in some ways, what's your preferred future? What do you want to see and what are you willing to help create? On the other side of this, so I guess the uh, I guess that uh, I guess that what I would like to see has a lot to do with the way the world was, as far as I'm concerned. And what I'm observing in this crisis, um, some things I believe. Right, one is I do believe that the coronavirus, or COVID nineteen, is uh, more dangerous than than the common flu. Right, I do believe that there is a danger out there, um, but there is also a danger of unintended consequences that we're facing by being isolated in our homes. We're facing uh, increased uh, mental health, suicide rates, delayed education for our children, bankruptcies, which will impact nutritional health, um, future income potential for our children and their children. Um, we're facing right now. We're having a, and people aren't going to the hospital. Um, right now, our hospitals are not full. Um, nurses are furloughed because they're not needed. And so on one hand, you're hearing all these things on the news about how dangerous the virus is. But at the same time, I'm being confronted with just some brutal facts that don't support the fear of the virus. Not to say the virus isn't dangerous. I'm just saying that we're also seeing some things that are, are, uh, uh, that are indicating that, that thankfully it's not as bad. The results itself are not as bad is, is, is originally thought. Now, granted, that probably has a lot to do with social distancing. It has a lot to do with uh, mistaken input variables, assumptions. Um, I don't know. But what I'm observing is that uh, the old world is still at play here. And you'll notice that uh, I, I, I'm not saying that there, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. The old world says um, that the, the right wing of the political spectrum will will differ from the left wing of the of the political spectrum what i'm what i'm observing in real time is the left wing is saying oh my gosh we need to stay inside the world's going to end if we don't and you're saying the right wing say oh my gosh let me out we need to work let us out let us out let us out and um there is a real chasm right now in this country in this state and especially here locally between the Democrats, the Republicans, the left and the right. What I would like to see in the new world is an ability to collect data, ask questions, and actually just come to the table in a way that we're, at, we're looking for truth and answers. Uh, because I think that uh, the old world, and this current crisis is being driven by political ideology and opinions. And everybody says that their, their opinion is backed by science, but I just look and, and I don't trust anything. So one is I would like the old world to go away and I'd, li I'd love to see those political divisions just die. I would like to see, um, I would like to see a healthy skepticism come back to, to this country. Um, I think that older generations are naturally skeptical, but uh, the younger generations, it just seems like anything we read on social media, we just buy is true. Um, I would like to see that that go away when it's all done so that we all just have a solid dose of, is that true? 
I mean, we saw it in the last election with the Russians and, and Trump's campaign. We're seeing it now, I believe, to some extent with uh, the regular media and social media and armchair news people. I mean, it's just, it's just a mess. Um, I also think that what I would like to see in the old world is um, everything that existed before, at least in my life, is temporary. I mean, it was proven to be temporary. Um, the places we went to worship, our churches, I mean, gone, you know, just gone. And who knows when they're going to open. Um, you've got the, uh, you've got work institutions that would allow us to feed our families, just close down, you know, clients that would, uh, that would come in, just don't come in anymore. Um, money and financial security, just gone. Uh, not just for me, but for my employees. Um, uh, just everything just seems so temporary which means we've got to look inside ourselves to start asking ourselves, well, what's really important? You know, it certainly isn't work. It's not the church. Um, it might be things like purpose and faith and, uh, and uh, self-reflection. Um, I would hope that it doesn't take a pandemic, pandemic in the next 100 years for people to sit down and kind of reflect on, well, all right, what are my weaknesses? What are my strengths? Um, uh, or, or something to coin a phrase for me, what are my worst fears and my best hopes? Um, we, we don't need, I would hope that we don't need a crisis of, of this level and months of isolation and missing our old lives to really start appreciating those things that are important. And so uh, I guess the answer is uh, uh, vision and the way we look at the world, I would hope would change. And I would hope that we would have more patience with one another, that we would uh, be more hesitant to believe what we want to believe and uh, we all be willing to come back to the table and be a little bit more patient, a little bit understanding, more understanding and just uh, finding middle ground that would allow us to view the world in a way that we just admit that we don't know what the hell we're doing. And so why don't we try to just get along, love each other, push through together without the drama of the far left taking their point of view and the far right right taking their point of view and everybody jockeying for political power or religious power or money power. Just, uh, we're all just dudes sitting in front of a video camera and, and uh, <laughs> other than that, you know, what's inside in your family is about all you got. Sounds like pretty, pretty powerful in, uh, in personalized value statements as the, as the connector and values as the connector on the on the far side of this indeed listen I, I appreciate your time i appreciate your contribution to this and i'll say again i appreciate your contributions to the community right, thanks so God. thanks for the time uh thanks for your your insights keep yourself safe and healthy and and your family and and friends as well you too all right, all right. later bye sandy cedar assistant city manager Thank you so much for lending your voice and your vision to this Longmont Voices and Vision project. Each of these interviews, we've started by learning a little bit about the interviewee. So tell us who you are. Okay, well, first of all, thanks so much for the opportunity. And Tim, thanks so much for doing this. I think you're right that, um, you know, when, we, when you first sent information about this, that it started as an idea, but it's turning into sort of a historical record. I love that concept because um, I think a lot of folks have talked about like the plague and what it was like in, in 1918 flu and and here's an opportunity for us to to really record what's happening for people as it's happening for people. So thanks so much. Yeah. For so I'm assistant city manager. I've been assistant city manager for six years, seven years now, but I've been with the city of Longmont for 21 years. I started in the public works division um, and have worked with all the different departments on everything from communications to strategic planning to legislative work. And um, my job now is to uh, be, be the uh, lead of the shared services, which are 13 divisions that are doing all the internal work. So that's everything from human resources and accounting and finance and budget, risk, fleet, IT, all those folks um, that, are, that are really making sure that the organization continues to run all the time, but especially now. Sandy, you know, first of all, thank you for, for all of your contributions, not only for, to this project, but for everything you do for the city and, and our residents. Uh, you know, I'm gonna ask you three questions. The first of those is, 
in this time of um, unprecedented, at least in, the, in our lives, the kind of physical separation and social distancing we're experiencing. Uh, how are you getting yourself through the, a time of, uh, of great uncertainty? It's a great question, and it's one that I um, have been asking other colleagues as well. How are things going? How are you getting through? What are the things that you're doing for yourself um, to make sure that you've got the oxygen mask secured firmly on yourself as you're trying to help everybody yeah. else? Um, our yeah. department is really shared services, support services for every other department, um, and that includes everything you want to purchase, everyone you want to hire, everything you want to drive, and so trying to make sure that we're taking really good care of ourselves and our families and our customers um, is really is, is a drive and a passion that I think helps to get us through. Um, certainly helps me to get me through every day. One of the things that I've been focusing on during this event has been communications to the community and to the employees and really making sure that it's accurate, that it's timely, that it's constant, that they know that we're here, that they know that we're in support of what they're doing to give guidance and encouragement to the employees um, to give encouragement and even some fun things to do to the to the community. Um, I don't know if you've seen the rec pages, but they are doing online rec classes and they're awesome. Everything from senior yoga to cardio sculpt. And so lots of different opportunities for, for people to be able to connect and do something. Um, how I'm personally trying to get through all of this is just making sure that I stay connected with my team, that I stay connected with my family, that I stay connected with myself and my own needs as all of this happens because um, certainly a lot of us work from home at times before this but not like this <laughs> and so making sure that people have the equipment the the training the information that they need to be able to connect with each other um, has been really the other focus of what i've been trying to make sure happens out there and our teams are just amazing i have to tell you the communications team the ETS team, all of the divisions of the shared services have really put their heart and soul into making sure that our departments are, are supported through this, whether that's very generous leave policies or whether that's making sure that the fire trucks are in tip top shape or whether that's making sure that we're buying every mask we can find for our public safety responders. You know, it really is neat to see our team just jump in with that passion and try to make sure that they're getting through so that the staff can get through so that the community can get through. Well, and in, in, as we get through, we're doing that at, at distance. You talked about now it's a steady diet of working at home. We're doing this interview virtually uh, because of the, the, the stay at home order, uh, which creates a, a new uh, kind of a need, and that is to figure out uh, how to stay connected with friends and family. So how are you? staying connected to your friends and family in this time of, of um, st uh, staying home and sheltered? Yeah, you know, I, I think the technology that we have today is absolutely amazing. Um, I really think that there's so much opportunity to stay connected in such a different way. Uh, my family is all out of state for the most part. My, my mom and dad and, and sister and such are all out of state. Um, and so we already had been connecting digitally forever. <laughs> so we make phone calls regularly. We do, you know, video visits. We text each other. We're able to keep keep connected. But I think um, what's changed in this event is just the regularity of it. Just making sure that every few days we're checking up on each other and how things are doing and do you need anything and how is it going and what questions do you have and, you know, what can I do for you? Um, and I think that's really the most important you know, way to just, just, it's just constant. However you connect, make, making sure that you do connect. That's really the most important piece. I will tell you too, we've had a few virtual happy hours with some friends, I'll say, <laughs> which is weird, but fun. <laughs> I'm hearing a lot about virtual happy hours in these interviews. Yeah. So <laughs> other forms of, of distance, uh, virtual connections. Uh, so, yes, uh, my oldest and this seems to be having, I'm not sure if he's doing board games with his friends virtually. I'm not sure exactly how that would work, but it's, it's fun to see people connecting in all sorts of new and different ways. Well, the truth is I have heard about people playing virtual bridge and virtual board games. So, yeah. Uh, you know, my third question uh, is based on the presumption that whatever was normal uh, before we got into this situation, uh, life is likely to be different on the other side when we're able, when we're not 
operating under a stay-at-home order and, and we can re-engage with one another. There's gonna be a new normal that emerges. The question for you is, what would be your preferred future? What's the new normal you'd like to see and, and that you're willing to help create? It's a great question. One, one I've been thinking about, um, you know, being in charge of the technology for the city overall and with a huge team of people way smarter than me, um, what I really found is that we had the backbone of the technology to be able to enable this to happen, uh, but, the, but people didn't have time to take training on it. They didn't really know how it worked, and so it's been a super huge crash course in how do we use this technology to keep connected. What occurs to me is that we have so many people um, every single day that have a hard time connecting. Either they have mobility issues, or there's health concerns, or there's other things that keep people in the house and disconnected from their community. And my hope is that at the end of this, that we're able to connect people, that we're able to connect people that weren't connected before, um, to really be able to participate in the community, to be able to, you know, maybe talk to their families when they couldn't before. Um, you know, I certainly know a lot of seniors that are learning Zoom very quickly right now so that they can connect with their grandkids. And that's, that's amazing because that will carry over as we continue from here. Um, the other thing is that I think we're all recognizing just how much we do like to spend time with each other and gather and be a community and, you know, and come together, whether it be for events or commencements or concerts or whatever that looks like. And so I hope that um, at the end of this, we have a newfound appreciation for each other, a newfound tolerance for each other, um, and just, just the, the ability to connect with each other in a more seamless way, I would say. You know, I keep telling my staff and keep telling my family, we're just making lemonade here. You know, every time I get to have lunch with my kid, you know, because his school is closed, I'm like, hey, this is just lemonade today that we get to do this. And so really taking advantage of those things that we recognize as new and great and being able to amplify on that into the future. Sandy Cedar, thank you again for your many contributions to the city of Longmont, and especially in this moment for your contribution to the Longmont Voices and Vision project. Take care of yourself, stay safe and healthy, and take care of your family. Thanks, Tim, you too. Carol Dominguez, thank you for your willingness to contribute to the Longmont Voices and Vision Project. Uh, each of these interviews, uh, we've started out by learning something about the person being interviewed. So tell us a little bit about Carol Dominguez. Yeah, so, um, you know, obviously I think a lot of people know, some may not know. I, I serve as the city manager here in Longmont. Important part of this interview for people to know, I think. So, yeah. and so, um, you, you know, the, Prior to that, I uh, actually uh, grew up in a small, I was born and raised in a small town um, in Texas, just west of Lubbock. Um, believe it or not, it was like 1,200 people, small school, really close-knit community. Uh, from there, I, I went to um, Texas Tech University and lived in the dorms, which, you know, being thrust, there were more people living in my dorm than actually lived in my entire community. So that was an adjustment for me. And that, and, you know, during my undergrad, Thought I wanted to be a lawyer, but then learned very quickly I actually wanted to be in local government. And what I didn't know at the time was that a lot of my, I had an uncle who helped raise me, and uh, he he was involved. He was in the military and then became involved in local government. And um, his wife actually became the city administrator eventually in my hometown once I was in college. And so, and I knew all the city managers in that town, so it really intrigued me and decided I wanted to do that. So I went into the public administration program, the master's degree program, and um, was fortunate to work in the city of Lubbock during that time. Um, and, you know, as we talk about what we're doing, um, I really had some strong mentors that brought me in and received, a, you know, all sorts of training and opportunities, even worked in sign, sh sign shops where I was making street signs and doing things and um, a lot of training in emergency management. And then from there, kind of worked up in that system and went to San Angelo, Texas as an assistant city manager. And suddenly that city manager went to another location and I had the opportunity to um, take that position and then moved to Longmont. And, and so that's sort of been how I've evolved from a, you know, a boy in a small town to a city manager of Longmont, Colorado, which I love. 
Um, and I can say that that's um, even my family goes, you know, best move of our lives. And, and so we're, we're just thankful to be here. Well, as I've said to you, I've tried to make few editorial comments in this, but I will make this one. Uh, to end up in Longmont, yeah, it's like to end up in one of the great places in America to live. So you really do, and yeah. I think um, you know we've just got to be thankful for the community that we have, uh, and and the people that live in our community, and and how we work with each other. It, um, you don't find that in all places, and and when you do, is when you really real, realize just how lucky you are to be part of this community. Yeah. Well, you know, these interviews consist of three questions. The first question is in this period that's at least unprecedented for me and any of us in our lifetimes, the kind of physical separation and social isolation that we're experiencing. How are you getting through? How are you getting yourself through this period of time? You know, uh, a lot of different things. It's kind of interesting. Today, I'm actually working at home. So if you hear a humming, uh, somebody's running the vacuum cleaner upstairs, <laughs> and so, um, you, you know, I think you have a lot of choices when you go into these situations in terms of how you approach it and, and what you can do, and, you know, the, the first thing I will say is um, getting through this um, would be impossible without the support of um, my wife, Andrea, and Hunter and Haley, my two kids. Um, I think, you know, a lot of times we take for granted, um, you know, the individuals that are closest to us, but you know, when they're coming here and they realize this thing's going on and just how they're there for me as an individual is, is a really big piece of this. And, but then you look at it and you go, I can approach it, you know, one way where, you know, you know I'm, I'm just like, don't like using this analogy, but it's chicken little, the sky's falling and, and, and it's just bleak. Or I can take the other side of it and approaching it to say, and I have some fundamental beliefs that out of every situation, there's always a positive. We just have, you know, strive to find that positive. And out of chaos, there's always opportunity. Um, and, and so for me, it's really, you know, just been about, you know, just being thankful for the things that I have. And my daughter's 17 and she's a junior. And it was interesting for me in this to realize that I'm getting the rare opportunity to spend time with a 16 year old and a 17 year old who under normal circumstances are rarely at home. And so now I've at least had a month and maybe even more time with them um, that I wouldn't have gotten in any other situation. And, and so for me, that's great. Um, now there are times I think where we all get tired of each other and we, move our own in our own areas but you know I get through it through them um, you know it also is a little challenging and then I have a mother that's in her late 80s and my aunt who um, helped my mom raise me as well she's in her late 80s and so we had plans for them to come and visit or we were going to go visit and now we're all sitting there going when is this going to happen but again you know I can dwell on that or we talk to each other now probably more than we did or um, uh, a daily basis, if not a couple of times a day to really reinforce that and, and stay connected as we're doing this. And then, you know, I'm a bit of a techie. So also my friends, you know, there's a lot of group chats that we have going on um, where we're just connecting in different ways and, you know, talking about how, how can we do different things virtually. And so it's really about just being focused on being connected to those folks that are, you know, immediately around you, your friends, your colleagues, um, and, and finding any way you can to have those conversations. And, and for me, that's what gets, gets me through it. And, and the other thing that I have to say too is, um, we have an amazing team here at the city of Longmont. And so I think the thing that is important about how you get through it as well is, there's not a challenge too great for any one uh, of the members of our organization. Um, and, and, and I think when we, when we deal with this, and, and I look back to the flood too, um, there's always a sense of fearlessness that, that you know, is embodied by um, the entire organization and a willingness to say, you know, we're here for these times and we're here to support the community and the residents 
um, and we've got to really make sure we're doing our best work. And, you know, there hasn't been a task yet that when you go to them and go, here's an issue that we just haven't said, they haven't said, okay, we've got it, let's deal with it, let's work it. And so when you have a team like that around you, um, that also is, is extremely um, inspiring to me in this position. And, and, and I will tell you that daily I'm inspired by something that someone has done in the organization where you just look back and you go, wow, we have amazing folks here and I'm part of an amazing team um, that, that really is completely focused on doing everything we possibly can for our community, for our state and our county because we're working across different lines. And at the end of the day, the things that we do here will help our nation as well. And so it's a combination of things that really keep me going, but um, they definitely ramp the energy up. So in your answer to this question, you, you have segued and may have already answered the second question, but I wanna ask it anyway. Uh, you obviously have your, your nuclear family with you, um, right. at home. uh, but we're, we're in this period of, of, of social isolation and people are challenged to figure out how to stay connected to family and friends. It is. Any, anything else you want to add to, to, uh, the time you're spending with your, your, your nuclear family and, and obviously you're spending time connected with your colleagues, your team, uh, what else, what else should we know? Um, you know, at times, you know, it's, um, the things that I have to do occasionally is just disconnect. Um, and whether that's reading, um, we built a thing for my kids in the backyard where we can hit a volleyball and the three of us can stay, you know, we're not impacting anyone else, but we're, we're playing together. Um, you know, it's been challenging too at times. Um, uh, you know, I talked about the communication with my mom and I think the communication with my broader extended families really been on you know Facebook and things like that um, but you know they you know as a family we actually had an interesting challenge in that I had a cousin that um, was one of the first um, positive COVID patients in, in that county which is really isolated and unfortunately he passed away and and so then you know how are we communicating and supporting our relatives during this and and unfortunately, you can't get together in this time. And so it's just using any mechanism you can. Um, you know, I've also, unfortunately, I watch a little bit of mindless TV. Um, I don't put the news on um, because I get enough of that during the day. Um, but it's, you know, it's a lot of hanging out with my family, finding different games. Um, you know, I dabbled in Fortnite with my son for a while, which is an experience. And um, we're... Uh, trying to do that again. I think he's a little embarrassed with me when I play. I'm like the Saturday Night Live skit where the guy's <laughs> running and bouncing into the ball. Um, so it's just, you know, we find as many opportunities as we can to, to just take advantage of the time that we have with each other. Yeah. Well, um, it's, it's reasonable to assume that, that this time with each other uh, will change, right? There'll be, a, right? there'll be a time when we come out from our homes uh, as, the, as the virus, uh, either we get it under control, we have a vaccine, and that there'll be a new normal that will mm -hmm. emerge. Um, the assumption here is that while we return to something that, un unlike where we are now, whatever's normal on the other side of the crisis, likely to be different than life was before we got into this situation. So the question for you is, what do you want to see? What's your preferred future? What would you like to see and experience when we come out of this? And what are you help, willing to help create as the new normal? You know, that's, a, that's an interesting question. And, and you know, we've, we've had a lot of virtual conversations. Um, um, and, and I think for me, I kind of go back to, you know, just, I think there's multiple pieces to this for me. Um, I mentioned that I grew up in a small town. I think if anybody's ever growing up in that type of environment, one of the things that I think is unique to, to small communities is just how connected everyone is, um, how willing they are to, to work and, and help each other and through any number of situations that occur on a daily basis in that community. 
And, and I think for me, you know, again, when I say, what, what are the bright spots in, in the situation that we're dealing with and what does that look like in the future? You know, I think there's been a reset in, in that regard in terms of how we interact with each other. Um, I said before, you know, we all have any number of responsibilities as we move through this, whether it's, you know, following the stay at home orders, supporting our neighbors who aren't able to leave their house because they may have um, underlying conditions or they may be of the age where they're asking them to stay home. And I think what I've seen in this is, is you've really seen the community come together in that way. Um, and I've even seen it amongst my friends that I have here locally where we go to a grocery store and somebody's texting saying, hey, I'm at a grocery store. Does anyone need anything? You know, those are things that we never did before, but I think those are things that we need to capture today and build on in the future in terms of how do you take advantage of the connections in the, in, in the work that we've been doing as individuals supporting our nonprofits and various aspects of our community and just supporting our neighbors that we may not have talked to before. How do we take that and really escalate that to where we create more connectedness into the community where we realize that whatever the issue is, we're in it together and together we can face any challenge um, and, and continue propelling ourselves forward in terms of the opportunities that we have as a community. And so I think that's, you know, if I said there was one hope is how do you bring that small town atmosphere and connectedness to the larger communities and cities across the nation where we truly realize we're, we're connected and, and, and what we do can help others, can hurt others. That's what we've seen in the stay at home order. And, and so for me, it's about really just amping up the connectedness across the community. Um, I think, you know, the second thing is, you know, this really is a game changer in, in a lot of ways. I think we don't know, um, you know, what it's going to look like in the future in terms of the economy and these other issues. And, and I think it's, you know, being able to then take that connectedness and step forward and say, what, what do we really envision for ourselves in terms of the future of the community and, 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 and how we build upon what we already have. And we are completely focused on, on what we can be um, to, to really ensure that everyone has opportunities in long life that um, we are providing what we need to for our community um, so that we can then support some of these other programs and um, really just looking at um, what is it gonna take for, for us as um, members of an organization and how we partner with the community to set that stage where we can be stronger um, as, as a community and be able to withstand future economic challenges, again, building off of the connectedness. And I think that's, a, that's an, an, another piece. And then I think more globally on that is, is just to, to realize when, when we hit this, that there will be other challenges coming to us in the future. You know, I've looked back and I was actually here a year and a half when the flood hit. And that was the, largest natural disaster that I think the state of Colorado had already hit. And, and as I talked to my colleagues, most of us only have that once in our careers. But well, we've now all of a sudden had a second one. Um, and I think it's, it's building on this to, to know that no matter what challenges us as a community, we will be stronger at the end of that challenge and we will work together to ensure that we're stronger. Um, and, and I kind of said this about the organization. Um, I think it's, oh, it's okay to be afraid. Let's understand what that fear looks like. And then how do we, as a community, really become fearless on tackling challenges big and small in the future with the mindset of, of supporting every aspect of our community um, and, and ensuring that no matter who lives in Longmont, they have the opportunity to be successful in the future. Um, and I think we can learn a lot from this. And, and so for me, 
you know, I've sort of rambled and bounced around, but I think it's about being stronger as a community, coming together um, as individuals, as neighborhoods, as organizations, and really being focused on how do we collectively work to better the community. Um, that's what my hope is for the future. City Manager Harold Dominguez, thank you again for, for sharing your vision, your, your voice and your vision with, uh, with Longmont in this project. Take care of yourself and your family, stay safe, and I'm looking forward to when we, when we do come out from the stay-at-home order that, uh, that we're able to meet and work again face-to-face. -face. Thank Same you, sir. Here. Thanks.